Welcome to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast. He is the legendino Tim Vickery, all set up in Rio de Janeiro of all places, whilst I am the Duke of Earl, also known as the Duke of Yak, uh, the grand old Duke of Yak who leads us up to the top of the hill and leads us back down again. How are you doing, Don? I'm doing very well. I'm not sure which of that was a compliment, <laughs> but thank you. I'll take it. Duke of Yak, why not? Mm -hmm. Um, as you know, Tim, uh, the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast always features a particular game in the annals of uh, footballing history. And, and, and this time we're talking about my, 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 my generation. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Do you consider yourself a product of yuppie heaven? Because no, 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 if no, we're talking about September 1987, it is yuppie heaven. Yeah, don't think about yuppies because remember, I've just come out of university in uh, June, July, 87. So the world's my oyster, but I'm only on 10 and a half grand a year. So don't give me the yuppie business. I've, I've just come out of university in June, July, 87. Uh, and uh, I'm on uh, 40 pound a week <laughs> on, the, on, on the enterprise allowance scheme. Oh, yeah. right, okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, one, I one of my bad. memories of this time is just being on the outside of restaurants, seeing people eating and stuff, these yuppies eating and thinking, what have I, I, I what yeah, have I, I what I, have I, I done I to deserve this? Yeah. <laughs> I, I was probably eating in the restaurant, not that I was on that level, but I was styling it out, if you see what I mean. Uh, so You're 30... getting someone else to pay the bill, obviously. Well, no, just waiting for an opportunity to run out of the restaurant for me. I don't know about you. Those are the days, man. Needs must. It was a different world. Yeah, it it was, was a different world. And was. I think we will both be agreed later on, because we don't just look at a particular football match, but we also try and sort of give people a wider perspective of the times that they are changing. And we do that as well as looking at the social context as well musically. And I think we'll be both agreed later on that the music of that time, uh, at least the production, the sound of the drum machine, fuck's sake. <laughs> it had just taken <laughs> over, hadn't it? Oh, it, my it, word. Yes. And and House was just about to jump in, but you know, we should have been we should have been wary of House as we now know it because it was just about to literally ruin every great song uh, that was ever made. Uh, it, we'll we'll talk about that later on. But we're looking. It's true, Tim. Am I lying? Am I lying? <laughs> I, I, I think we're gonna have we're gonna find some common ground here. I think we're gonna have so let's start with the match first of all. This is the 1987-88 European Cup tournament. Uh, we're in the first round, first round, 30th of September 1987. We're in the first round of the competition and two of the mighty giants historically at least well actually sorry one of the mighty giants of uh, European football is about to take on the new kids on the block in a way the Italian champions but certainly yeah it's two, it's, it's two of the champions from the major leagues isn't it that's a better way of putting it. Yeah, indeed. And one of the champions from one major league has got a certain Diego Maradona playing for it. So, you know, th there is a lot of interest in this game, but there is also a question mark, not least from Silvio Berlusconi, who later went on to become the Italian prime minister, as to why this is my Italian accent. I apologise mm. via Nigeria. Mm. But I did go to Italy for a day. Um, why? Why two biggest teams in Europe? are meeting each other in the first round, the first round of this competition. We must start a European Super League so that none of these big teams ever have to face each other in the first round of this knockout competition again. Milan straight out of Lagos. Thank but you. you you've, you've hit the nail on the proverbial because on this game, at the time, there's nothing... Ex particularly remarkable about it and especially for Brits because England English teams were not in that had been banned from from European competition so this game didn't get a great deal of publicity at the time and for two big teams to be drawn under the European Cup as the Champions League was then known was straight knockout all the way 
And part of straight knockout is like the FA Cup. It's luck of the draw. Who'd you get? Uh, and it just so happened that the champions of Spain were drawn against the champions of, of Italy. It's just the way it was. That's the way it Liverpool, should be. Well, <laughs> yeah, and Liverpool fans will remember that when they won the European Cup 77 and 78, the next season, first round, who are they drawn against? Nottingham Forest. And England had two then because Liverpool were in as holders and Forest were in as, as champions of, of England. So, you know, they played themselves, they, they played each other in the first round. As, uh, as Ice-T would say, they played themselves. I always remember him saying that to uh, on, on BBC <laughs> Two, Two's The Late Show, looking yeah, straight yeah. down the barrel, straight into the camera and, <laughs> and telling viewers of BBC Two's The Late Show that they had played themselves. Yeah. I don't know how viewers of BBC Two's The Late Show accepted uh, as, Well, as long, as long as they didn't confuse it with that they'd played with themselves. With themselves. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a different thing. That's different you know, I, I, I've lived in LA and I can tell you, you can play yourself. I remember starting <laughs> working in LA, a newspaper, and these, um, these black girls, you know, real street girls from LA kind of thing. You know, one of the girls, I simply, she worked there and I simply said to her, um, do, do you know when we get paid? And she left, ah, ha, ha, done. The new boy from England wants to know when he's going to get paid. And then all of them started laughing. <laughs> so apparently, um, I think, certainly when a man asks a woman, uh, the P um. can be substituted for another letter. <laughs> One thing I don't do in the 80s is get paid off little old ladies. I can't remember what rap lyric that is, but that's that's one from I, the time. I, I've never heard that one. <laughs> yes, yeah, good. Well remembered from those yeah. times. There's always one that sticks with you. Yeah. And, and that's by way of saying that this match won't stick with you. And by the way, we're talking about the second leg of the first round of this European Cup tournament, 87-88 uh, season. So the first leg was arguably as unremarkable well, it's behind although, closed doors the first yes, leg that's weird the Bernabeu of all places as well yeah that's I mean weird. Uh, Real Madrid fans had misbehaved the previous in the previous year and so it, it, it did have a, a real unreal quality that because obviously no one's used to playing behind closed doors no, no, sure. we've, we've, uh, not like it, now. It's, indeed it's a new the, the, the new normal but it, it, it wasn't normal then um, but so at the time this is relatively unremarkable it just happens. It's part of the fabric of a cup competition. And also, well, Napoli never won this title and never really got, they never got, they hardly ever been in it and never got close to winning this title, but they do have Diego Maradona. And Real Madrid, well, let's remember that Real Madrid hadn't won it since 66 and weren't going to win it until 98. So at that particular moment, no, I don't think people would have necessarily have seen them as the giants that we see them today. They had a very good side at this time. They'd won the UEFA Cup in two years, 85 and 86. The previous season, they got to the semi-final of, of the European Cup and lost to Bayern Munich. They got they reached the semi-final again this time. Uh, and uh, they, they lost to PSV on, on away goals. The other semi-final is Benfica and Steo Bucharest of Romania, who had won the competition in 86. Uh, and uh, they had Georgi Hadji and Lakatouche. So you can see it's a totally different panorama in European football. There's, there's a, uh, uh, an equality of forces, more or less across the board. And look at these teams that are, that are, that are arriving at the business end. And the reigning European champions at this time were, were, were Porto. The winners before had been had been stable Bucharest, so it's a totally different scene of European football, and I think most people just kind of, all right, what happens? You know, Real Madrid played Napoli in the first round, and uh, Real Madrid won the first leg two 0 Napoli could only win the second leg. leg uh, uh, no, it was one one the, uh, the the second leg, and they go out. So I like most people shrug their shoulders, and and the planet spun on its axis as it usually does. But as you said. There's one man there who's having a look and thinking, well, that ain't right. Uh, and that's Berlusconi. Now, Berlusconi has history. In uh, 1980, there's a, a mini World Cup in Uruguay. I think it's celebrating 50 years of the World Cup. Uh, and uh, all of the World Cup winners are there. So it's like a closed shop. The only World Cup winner that doesn't turn up is England. 
because it's held over the like, Christmas New Year period when you know English football doesn't doesn't close down. So Holland substituted England. So you you had a little tournament there for winners of the World Cup, uh, and uh, that was part financed by Berlusconi. It's one of the first things he did with his his new media empire. So he's got the concept then. Ah, yeah, a specially made tournament for a hand-picked number of big teams, and I can finance that, and that can be the content for my, 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 my media platforms. So he's already been thinking about that since 1980, and then he's looking at the economic logic of Real Madrid and Napoli, one of them get eliminate, getting eliminated early, and it's Berlusconi who's thinking, well, that ain't right. We got to fix this. We got to give the, the the big clubs more opportunities to generate content and more games against other big clubs, and avoid the idea of they can be eliminated from the season in the in what is effectively the the, the, the second month of the season. You know, the season starts in like middle of August, and by the end of September, you got a giant club already out of of the uh, of of the, the Europe's premier competition. So, from his point of view, this just makes no economic sense. And that's why I think this is yuppie heaven, because his idea, you know, the whole time there's on, on the one hand, there's, there's, ha there's house music. On the other hand, there's, there's, there's yuppie heaven. Uh, and uh, his kind of idea, his kind of thinking within five years, that's the direction that European football is taken because it, it then starts having a group phase. So there's more guaranteed incomes for, for the big clubs. I think you're right to do a kind of a, <clears throat> a, a wider analysis of uh, the background to this game and, and also the potential consequences of it. I think it's fair to say Silvio Berlusconi, whatever you think of him, was ahead of the curve in that thinking. I'm not necessarily saying that was the way that it should go, but he was way ahead of the curve. We're talking, you know, three three decades ago now. It's absolutely incredible. And he set the wheels in motion, of course, to what we saw a couple of weeks back as this, you know, ludicrous attempt to break it away uh, for, to the super, um, super League. But there is, and I'll come on to the yuppie one later on. I think that's worth a discussion because... This is the time when football is um, still relatively affordable, but it's going to change very soon. So the thinking is already, let's entertain the people who can afford the increase in the price charges. So basically, you're immediately discounting the football fans, the young kids who have grown up and had this affiliation and the working class roots of football, you're immediately discounting that. I'm about to introduce another audience. And I know that there were some tragedies from the English perspective uh, uh, that led towards that. You know, there was a trajectory of uh, all sorts of, um, well, tragedies in, in football that led towards the all sorts yeah, of stadiums. In, in English, also, English football was killing people on an, an, an industrial scale. Well, it? you uh, could argue that, yeah. Things yeah. like the Bradford Shocking. Fire, which is uh, which is sometimes overlooked in, in, in all the tragedies. 100%. Do you know, funny enough, what you say there, every time I see Bradford play, the first thing I think of, you know, they've got distinct kit anyway, the sort of like um, burgundy and yellow. So it quite, it, that burgundy and yellow just resounds in my mind um, with, you know, in connection with that fire. So as soon as I see it, that's what I think of. And I think, well, why am I the only one thinking about this, you know? Yeah. Anyway, this match does have some interesting talking points and some value for one thing real madrid in both legs had uh napoli completely sussed it seems to me napoli were on the back foot the entire first leg uh, they managed to totally neutralize maradona from the game and they uh it, it's arguable that real madrid should have scored a few more goals they had some perfect opportunities first round they won 2-0 uh, one of the goals was from a penalty, quite naive penalty given uh, mm. very early on in the game as well. It just looks ludicrous, isn't it? it? Does, the defending it does. is ludicrous. What are they mad. thinking of? But, but, you know, a lot of the Napoli defending in the first game, the first leg, was just kick it high, just kick it high, you know, get it away from the goal mouth. Kick it high, not kick it uh, forward. Yeah, again, uh, this, is, this is another point that, no, the, the, the entry of big sums of money into the game 
is 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 complex and contradictory, isn't it? Because and some people will just slag it off. But it's undeniable that the standards of the football played is much, much higher now than it was then. Uh, and just look look at these 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 two teams. And Real Madrid are a Spanish side, and quite a lot of locals in the side. Napoli, there is, although there is uh, Hugo Sanchez, the Mexican, comes back for the, their second leg. But apart from that, it's a Spanish side, I think. And, and Napoli is, is an Italian side, with the exception of Maradona and another Brazilian, Careca, who plays a second leg. So what you haven't got is this accumulation of the greatest talent from the, the, the four corners of the world congregated. So it, it's, it, it's, it, it's a different sport, I think, um, these two elite clubs then and now. Um, it's the, the differences are so big. Well, this is the joke that they talk about this Maradona side from 1987. Sorry, this Real Madrid side from 1987 as being one of the best Real Madrid sides of all time up to that point. And when you look at the game, you think, well, I'm not <laughs> sure if if they're the best. Like we used to say it, at school, you know, if that's the best you got to offer, I'd like to see the worst because <laughs> you know it wasn't much to go on. You know, compared to today, where yeah, we've been athletes, spoiled. The athletes are stallions as well today, aren't yeah, they? You know, they yeah. just look. You couldn't wear those tight shorts um, <laughs> if, with athletes today because it would be obscene. You know, it would breach some obscenity <laughs> rules, it feels like to me. Whereas in those days, you could get away with it. So first match, 2-0 to Real Madrid. Second match, which was uh, at Napoli's ground, wasn't it? And that yeah, was no, it, it, it is a cracker because you got fans and you got... And you got it just, it just looks Completely bonkers. Completely different atmosphere. It's just bonkers. Yeah. And Napoli score early and they're piling on the pressure. It went crazy when they scored early. Yeah. But when the Germans equalised, total silence. In fact, even from the yeah. TV commentators, it was like, oh, oh it's the end of the, no. It, it's the end of the game, even though it's before half time. Yeah, yeah. It's like the end of the game, you know, with the away goals rule. And, and I, I think it was like treated at, at the time as the end of the game. But for a while, it's great. I mean, Madrid had a, had a little goalkeeper, Boyle. I always thought he was an idiot from just from watching highlights at the time. He makes some great saves. Uh, and he proved and, you wrong. Yeah, yeah no, he did. It's he great did. to be proved wrong like that. Because every year at the end, you know, Real Madrid would mess up and Barcelona would win the title around that time. Yeah, yeah, or, you know, yeah. in the, and it always seems to me Boyle doing something really, really stupid. Mm. But here he's, uh, he's, he's a strange little goalkeeper. He's, he's little and squat figure. But here he stood up really big, had a terrific duel with, with, with Kadeka. So for a while, this game is really, really live. And then the away goal, which is Butragueño at his best, the little vulture that we all loved in the 86 World Cup. Hugo Sanchez just slipping the defence and he runs. And just with a touch, there's no frills, there's no extra, there's, there's, there's just ball in the back of the net, bang. And that ends it. And that's Napoli gone and Real Madrid in the next round. Yeah. Um, how on earth did. Real Madrid managed to contain Maradona for two matches, essentially. He was played out both matches. And I'm wondering whether we're looking at him past his peak here, because, you know, he got nutmeg by the defender. <laughs> the defender's, you know, dining out on it till today. What happened? Well, I remember when I was, I was new over in Brazil, talking to a football fanatic, and he said, you know, Pelé had some terrible games. Nothing against him. He was fantastic. He was better than anyone else. By a month. But he had some bad games. No one does it. No one does it all the time. And maybe this is this is just Maradona starting the downward slope. Perhaps um, there's there's not that much. Well, you know, and I, I suppose his story goes on until he tries to drag himself until the 1990 World Cup. But I don't. I think maybe what's happening off the field, and maybe just the punishment that he's taken on the field, maybe that's starting to take its toll. And also, you know, he, he, especially in the first leg without Kadeka, he doesn't have a great deal to combine with. So you know that that it makes it so much easier for a great player if he's got other great players to open up the field for him. If it's just him, then I think it's much much easier to control him. It was a, goes back to that conversation we had on the World Football phone in when a uh, listener asked whether the player makes the team or the team makes the player. And your conclusion was it always it's always the team that makes the player. And I think, you know, you've um, you've supported that conclusion with that last comment, although the way the world saw it was that 
that's Maradona's Napoli. Yeah, and it was. Napoli's Maradona. No, no, it it was when he lifted them from being also Rans to being Italian champions, taking on the domination of the North. And that's so important. One of my favourite films is uh, Visconti from 1960, Rocco and his brothers. And it's all about the the history of, uh, it's all about the Southern immigrants pouring North because that's what they got to do in, in search of work and the discrimination that they feel as, as being Southerners. It's, it's one of the huge subjects of Italy. And Napoli, the success of that Napoli side, allowed that soap opera to be played out every week because finally you've got a team from the South that can take on the Giants from, from Turin and Milan. So it, it, that's a fabulous soap opera. I would have loved to have been in Italy at that time. I've never been. Twice in my life I've had tickets and I still haven't managed to land there. Yeah, but that, yeah. that must have been a fabulous time, just not just for the football of Maradona, but for the kind of like the geopolitics of South versus North. Italy is very special in Europe, you know. Um, you know, you can say many European teams, uh, sure, European countries are are unique. But Italy is kind of special. It's, it's kind of different. It's um, full of beauty, I think. Um, and the Italians are kind of more Southern European than Southern Europeans. You know, they're a little bit kind of African about them for me. What, what, does that, does when that you get apply to the to, South? Does that apply? Yeah, because that that apply to to Milan and 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 probably not. You know, well, are they no. more Swiss there. Well, you, Look, they're more looking, Swiss, Austrian, German. Yeah, absolutely. Do you know looking my, down on these these these, these Africans? Uh, I, 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 had an, <laughs> I, I had an Italian girlfriend years ago, uh, and uh, and she was born in Naples, uh, and, uh, and she got used to get called uh, Marocchina, Moroccan, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, from some of the ones from the north. So there's there's a real edge there, isn't it? It is it is where Northern Europe meet, meets North Africa, isn't it? I suppose Italy. <laughs> That was another one of your many girlfriend stories. No, that's that's the only one so far. I trail you by about forty-five to one now, but at least at least I've opened my account. Oh my word! That's what you think of me. There is another aspect of this, and it, it actually leads on from what you just said, because, and I don't think this is a fair one, but let's uh, let's discuss it nevertheless. Real Madrid, famously the team of General Franco, yeah, the fascist dictator, as it were, in Spain. Napoli, because it's in Naples, you know what's coming. I'm going to make you an offer you couldn't refuse. (laughs) And apparently the Madrid coach was Dutch, Ben Hacker. He he, he made that accusation during the game. Of of the Neapolitans, yes. Yes. I, I heard about that. But... Does the, I suppose it must affect other supporters of a team. I wonder if the sort of roots, the unsavoury roots of a team or the unsavoury connections, whether they are deliberate or otherwise, does affect the players, the, 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 uh, the emotion of the game, the passion of the game or whatever. You know, if you're a left-wing club, once upon a time, like Liverpool, you would want to stick the boot into um, Chelsea, even though Chelsea were a working class club. Um, they were always working class club, but you know, they're in fashionable Chelsea, Kings Road. I remember interviewing um, Peter Osgood and you know, reminding him of how he was like known as the King of uh, the Kings Road or whatever, Osgood of Kings Road. And yeah, he, he took that. And then I thought, but you're different, you're like a working class guy. And you're being touted as being the sovereign of a really posh road that you can barely afford to go and get a cup of coffee in, frankly, nowadays, anyway. And you certainly know if you belong there or not, because, you know, if you belong there, you're coming out of one of those expensive boutiques. If you don't belong there, you're just walking along past that expensive boutique to, to the end of the King's Road. And I always thought, you know, when I grew up, I had a sense of, this is a working class club. Certainly not when I was very young, but certainly by the time I was in my teens, this is a working class club. This is the working class club. And you felt that there was some animosity because of that when they met. But but here, there doesn't seem to be any of that at all. No, I always felt with Chelsea, it was a right wing club. 
and back in the day. That was in the 80s, though, wasn't it? The 70s, well. yeah, 70s as well. Yeah, okay. okay. that, that was kind of late 70s. That was all that was the association that that that, that I, I had with it. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Well, th those people were in football and certainly I know having interviewed Paul Cannaville, who was the first black winger for Chelsea, uh, he will tell you about, you know, the way that they treated him there. There's uh, right wingers, as it were. OK, so we talked about the match. We talked about the absence of Maradona. Does this, given what we were uh, consumed by over the last couple of weeks with this uh, European Super League uh, nonsense. Given that, does this game, do we attribute the seeds of the European Super League to this particular game? Does it have resonance beyond the 30th of September 1987? I, I think it does. I think it has massive resonance because the, the idea that, that Berlusconi really wants to take away from this is that there must be guaranteed content for the big clubs in order for the big clubs to in order for it to be viable for the big clubs to invest the kind of money that they're going to be investing in top players they must have the certainty of of a set number of games and, and i think that that's been the driving idea of big european clubs ever since so uh, I, and I, I do i agree that it can all be traced back to this game, the idea that uh, that a giant can be eliminated in the first, in September, that starts to become unthinkable to those who are who are running the big clubs. And ever since, you know, starting in 1992 when you get a group stage, ever since, the big clubs have been wanting to find ways to bring certainty to a sport which is founded on sport itself is founded on uncertainty and that probably applies more to football than anyone else anywhere else and football is perhaps more than anywhere else it, it's the sport where you you can have upsets where the worst team can beat the strongest team it can't really happen in say basketball can it you know because it's a basketball has so many goals if you like that the better team is always going to score more goals than, than than but football a low scoring game if you ride your luck a little bit, then you can have an upset. But what the big clubs don't want is these upsets to upset their financial situation. They've just spent a lot of money on new players. They've got to pay the wages. Bang, you're out, you're, you're out, you're out of European competition in, in September. How can we avoid this? So uh, that, the, the drive to have guaranteed content, I think, can be, can be taken back to this game. You do know that it's called points in basketball, don't you? I don't really. No, you don't. is it points baskets? Yeah, I didn't. Yeah. I didn't know. That, that's why I said goals yeah. in kind of goals, in kind of yeah. uh, Doctor yeah. Evil inverted it's commas. Definitely not called goals. But yeah. so let's go for points. Can um, I say goals as in terms of objective? Yeah, I like that. You're very good. <laughs> on form today. God, I wish I'd brought my brain into gear as well, but. Do you know what was, you know, Wednesday, 30th of September? Do you know what was on the front pages of the papers? What the big stories were at the time? Big Bang, perhaps? No, no. The, the, hurri the hurricane? No, it's the, a spy no. story. A spy story. Or more precisely, a spy catching story. Right. It, it, it's it's nice he's, he's just releasing a book. Peter, whatever his name is, he's Peter releasing Wright. a book. Peter Peter, he's releasing a book and they're trying to sit on it. Yeah, Spycatcher was a book. Uh, yeah. He's now living in Australia, former MI5 officer or whatnot, and he's uh, broken the official secrets act by uh, doing, unlike Frederick Forsyth or uh, John Le Carre, who, who were writing fictional accounts, he kind of wrote about his time at uh, in the Secret Services. Of course, they, they all do it now. You know, former MI5 boss goes and writes her book or whatever it is, but in those days, it was so outrageous and it dominated every single bulletin. You know, it was the first item on BBC bulletins for certainly a couple of weeks, if not longer. So you saw this old bloke, he's now like about eight years old, curmudgeon the English bloke, and he wore one of those Australian sort of cowboy he did, hats. Yes, yeah. He did. yeah, where they had the corkscrews to, to keep the flies off. Yes. <laughs> I don't even know. But he had that all the time, walking into court and basically sticking two fingers up to the establishment. It was a shit book, by the way, so I wouldn't bother, you know, trying to sort of go in to buy that to, to read it. You, you're better off just reading a John Le Carre, for goodness sake. <laughs> but it was interesting to see a 
member of the establishment saying, "I oh, stuff you lot. I'm going to write what I like. I'm going to make, make some it. coin. And, and thank you very much for publicising it so well on the uh, main bulletin of the BBC <laughs> Evening News for weeks and weeks and weeks. <laughs> That's what was on the front page. And that was what we were consumed by. Uh, Neil Kinnock was the head of the Labour Party and was warning the Labour Party of a long slog to come, which actually was well, the, uh, quite the, predictive. The election had just happened a few months earlier, hadn't it? Yeah, June yeah. or something. And it, 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 it's a very significant election. The Labour Party got thrashed, and, and it is the big moment of Thatcher. Big Bang comes in, the deregulation, and it, it, it is yuppie heaven. But also, a mate of mine was uh, uh, that summer, a uh, mate of mine of, of uh, British, of England, uh, Indian extraction, he was somewhere in Africa. And people pointed out to him, black MPs. It's the first time, I think, for a while. There had been black MPs before, but this was English black MPs. There's a few of them that, that cut through in 87, and it hadn't really, really happened before. So as, as so often in the progress of society, you can see things going one way and also the other. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a huge triumph for, for Thatcherism, but also you can see a new part of our new working class being represented. You're absolutely right. And I totally forgot about that. This was a seminal moment for Black Britain, actually. The Gang of Four, as they were known there. The late Bernie Grant MP. Uh, he was MP for Tottenham. And then there was uh, Keith Vaz, uh, now discredit discredited in many ways, but MP for Leicester. There was Diane Abbott, who was in my constituency, Stoke Newington. It was um, Stoke Newington and Stanford or Stoke Newington? I think it was just Stoke Newington. I can't remember exactly what the constituency name was, but it was in Stokey. And uh, then the fourth member was, of course, uh, Paul Boiteng, who became MP in uh, was West London, was it? Was it possibly MP, not for Wembley? I suspect it was Wilsdon or something like that. Uh, it was certainly around that area. And they'd been uh, selected after a long campaign within the um, Black members of the uh, Labour Party, a campaign that was known as Black Sections. Black Sections, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I knew one of the people that started a woman called Sharon Atkins, and she was supposed to be one of those MPs, but uh, she was uh, perhaps even a little bit of a, you know, a, a fireball, firebrand or whatever for, for the Labour Party. So she was deselected controversially. But I used to go to her house in uh, Streatham, I remember, uh, years ago. But anyway, that was a seminal moment. And I'm not going to tell you which way I voted. But let me just tell you, I got out of bed very early <laughs> that day to go and vote. Very, very early to go and vote. To make sure that work didn't get in the way. You know, just after I finished university, I'm working, trying to make some corn. Remember, I'm on ten and a half grand, unlike some. Unlike some. <laughs> well, I won't mention. So I'm, 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 I'm coining it in, as it were. And I, I went, I remember it very clearly. Um, I went very early in the morning to go and vote, and uh, I, I, f I felt that I'd done my civic duty. Mm. I felt I'd done my civic and I still do. Uh, but let me just say that Diane Abbott's no fan of mine. <laughs> no fan of mine. It's not the other way around. Remember what I said? Uh, I've been in some weird situations with her, and the last one was so um, unappetizing that I, I walked out of, you know, I was in Parliament, I just that stuff that I'm not going to sit here and take that kind of uh, nonsense from this woman so I left anyway that that aside let's talk look at the charts and the charts are really worth well why are you laughing why are you laughing <laughs> well as as long as, as well as as well as girlfriend stories there are often <laughs> often stories of of, of conflicts with uh, and you just seem so genial I, I was <laughs> you look trust me you've known me a long time I'm telling you I swear I've done nothing I've done nothing to deserve the treatment that I've got. I've never done anything. <clears throat> First time I remember a conflict with Diane Abbott was she literally threw me out of her office, you know, physically threw me out of her office. And it was bonkers, you know, the, the same thing she threw me, the same question she threw me out of her office for, she was um, laughing when asked the same question on 
uh, what was it, Radio One, Newsbeat. I remember I heard it a couple of days later and I thought, what did you go? Now, the next time um, when I go to a party of somebody who's leaving the BBC at this sort of private club on Shaftesbury Avenue, uh, she's there early and I get there early and then she starts talking to me because she's had some bad press over sending her son to a private school. And then, you know, she comes up to me personally, me, you know, I, I didn't ask her because I'm like a bit wary of her. This way. She comes up to me personally and just says, um, in Jamaican patois, the most, the most I think me mad if you go send me one boy picnic for one of them schools there, you know? And I'm like, oh my word. You know, I was generally, she had a conversation and it was very genial, it was very genial. <laughs> And the next time I see her, is, I mean, she was like, just changes every time. And I'm not, this is not a personal yeah. thing about that person. In fact, let's take this out, actually. Let, let, let's take all of that out, Mark, because it's not fair to go down that route. It's got nothing to do with the podcast, but uh, Tim being mischievous forced me <laughs> to give an explanation. You know what he's like. So let's get back on board. I was wondering if there was a story with you, you and Diane Abbott fighting on the stairs and rolling down the stairs to get a fighting you know that, that's what that, that that was a dream scenario <laughs> well and there's definitely no um, story about well you know the Jeremy Corbyn kind of shenanigans with Diane Abbott either so let me put that one <laughs> to one side and bury that <laughs> very deeply onward and upwards yeah indeed so the charts at the time let's talk about the charts interesting we've already said this looks like a yuppie chart well number one was the um, the dance hall and club anthem of the moment, uh, Pump Up the Volume by Mars, which just, you heard everywhere. And Mars was this, uh, you know, get, uh, band that had been put together by DJs and stuff. It was one of the first of these sort of like DJ, but, but this was a team of DJs all getting together and doing it. And it was a decent, decent and a half tune, to be honest. But when you have a listen to it, do you know what it reminds me of? Malcolm McLaren's Buffalo Girls right. from, from yeah, well, about seven years before. Seven the eight influence years. is the same, isn't it? You know, yeah, totally. M M McLaren has, has, has got his finger on what's happening in New York. A decade got, before this. And he's just got there first, doesn't he? But yeah, it, it, yeah. it's the same things kind of seeping through. Oh, yeah, 100%. And it, it sounds very much like, I think it might even have the same sort of tempo, if I remember rightly. But the way that they cut up... Oh. Um, you know, snippets of people talking, you know, yeah. uh, and stuff like that. that was totally Malcolm McLaren. He was kind of a cut and paste kind of guy. Number two, interesting enough, and I say number one, Mars, even though they had like a club thing, it was by this time the club scene was getting to be what we now know it to be, you know, um, with these clubs that just started excluding people, uh, for example, you know, and um, Mars, the pump up the volume was a kind of anthem for those clubs as well. Miss yeah. Ministry of Sound, for example. Ministry Indeed. of Sound comes up about this time. It's not a club like we used to know it, you know, like mm -hmm. some d dingy dive down in the basement in some sort of suburb of uh, inner London. No, it wasn't like that at all. It was kind of like you got glam up for this all of a sudden. Well, it's a club as business as well, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. yeah, which is which is why I go on about, about Yuppie Heaven. And before we leave that, because th there's a few of, you know, this... Uh, House Nation, also in the chart, which is which is a similar, you know, it's the same thing, isn't it? You know, it's get a DJ together and 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 kind of cut and paste. There's a band who were around at this time, who again used a lot of this cut and paste, and I think that I think they were very interesting. Big Audio Dynamite. Yeah, they were was, very different. They were very different. It was, it was Mick Jones's thing, you know, yeah, yeah. coming out coming out the clash. I interviewed them, you know, when I'm they sure did, did. Uh, they had a twelve inch called the Last White Christmas, and of course Dennis Morris, a great photographer, absolutely fantastic photographer, one of the proper original rock ph photographers, um, and a nice bloke as well. Uh, when I last saw him, anyway, he was part of Big Audio Dynamite. He did all their sort of cut and paste of what you're referring to. Cutting well, it was, videos. And Don Letts was in him as well. Don Letts, who, I, would, I would imagine your paths yeah. have crossed with him a, f a fair few times. Yeah. But the thing with fact, sorry, Dennis, Dennis Morris was their photographer. Apologies, I actually meant Don Letts. Don Dennis Letts. Morris was their photographer, though. Uh, one of the things that strikes me about Big Audio oh, Dynamite, I, I found them really interesting. But something that put me off them, I think they looked absolutely shit 
Yeah, they did. They did. Because they just tried to copy this kind of beat boy thing from the States. So it was like baseball caps and like track suits. That was only a part of it. Yeah. What I remember was Long John's. One of them, the bass right. player with the dreadlocks, uh -huh. wore long johns and then leather jacket on top kind of thing. So they did try, they were looking for, yeah. this is a problem with some of the music that you're getting in the charts. Some of it should never have been released because it's people searching for a groove or searching for a vibe. Like that Jack Le Freak. Chic have done a brilliant song called Le Freak. Let's just try and mash it up and take it somewhere else. That's not a record. That is, that's an no, it's, 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 it's a assault. DJ exercise, isn't it? But it, it, they have to actually play Le Freak itself in the middle of it. Why not uh, just re-release Le Freak? <laughs> Nobody asked you to talk up the tempo and put this beat up five minutes before the track starts. But that's what's going on in these charts as well. A lot of the stuff are demo tapes as far as yeah. I'm concerned, not but, proper the, music. Where I'm going to go, this is obviously an, an, an extremely superficial point, but it's important to me, is... Is this moment, is it like the end of all of those tribes, of all of those subcultures who've defined themselves through music and clothes together? Because when I mean, that big audio dynamite, look, they're, they're trying to borrow from the States. You know, the baseball craps, they just look shit anyway. And, and the tracksuits, and when you're looking at the big rap stars, they might have a baseball cap and a tracksuit, but it, you're looking at the big chain. You know, and it's photoed in a way that makes the big chain stand out. When big, I thought big audio done like they just look shit doing it. So there, there, there was no real visual thing to cling on to in the way that there had been with so many other youth movements before. And uh, is this moment the end of those tribes? Not, not for me, and not at all. Arguably, the tribes continue till today. In a not formal sense but for example you see a bunch of kids walking down the roads you know you know they're into grime there is a kind of a and, and maybe it's not a uniform so much as the swagger if that right. makes sense yeah so you know everybody today can all afford you know the flashiest or the most fashionable clothes or copies of the most fashionable clothes if you see what i mean you might not be able to afford the nikes but you can afford the tesco nikes or whatever it is and do your best in that way and that's not putting people down because a lot of us can't afford these uh, things we should take note of that but the tribes still exist and musical tribes still exist if you're into hip-hop you're not into anything else, you know. That's all you listen to, hip hop. If you're into grime, it's a proper nine to five. You're not. But you know, is is there the tribal sense of the clothes that go with it? The swagger that goes with it, yeah. Right. Uh, Every time you see these kids, you know they look like you know, and I'm not knocking them because I get it, but they look like you know they want to fight you or they want to fight somebody, uh, and that is a tribe's mentality. Yeah, it's an attitude. Like, yeah. We're, we're coming up to the. 10th anniversary of the London quote unquote uprising, some people might mm -hmm. like to uh, describe it as. Uh, most people describe it as the thuggery that uh, ensued after the death of uh, a local youth in Tottenham, shot dead by the police, Mark Duggan. And then riots happen in Tottenham, as you know, and spread all across the country all across the country and not necessarily after you know two or three nights the uh the riots didn't seem to have anything to do with the original incident at all and it spread right across the country uh for about a week or whatever before the uh authorities were able to lock it down properly but and that was an instant it is an uprising and uh, not necessarily in a positive way but it is an uprising because it was a mass movement of young people. That's what this was identified by. And I can't tell you if there was a sort of a sense of togetherness, but I do know that I heard younger people all the time sort of saying, oh yeah, you know, it's all kicking off in South London, quick, let's do it. Even up the road for me, you know, in mm -hmm. sort of middle-class suburbia, there were some young kids that just set light to a car. I was like, bloody hell, they <laughs> said like in broad daylight as well. Smoke everywhere, set light to a car. You know, that didn't happen in, in suburbia before that.
Well, there's, there's more of this coming, isn't it? Because more and more young people are now excluded from that. They've got they've got no skin in the game. They've they've got no chance of of of, of getting on. They're, they're just machines for generating profits. Yeah, yeah. Through through, through the debt the debt trap, and it all starts now, September of eighty seven. Big bang, deregulation, explosion right. in, 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 in property are prices. Absolutely right. You're and absolutely there's, a, right. there's a song for me. I, I, I like him, obviously. But there's a song for me. It's lower down in the charts that kind of sums up in a way. And that's Luther Vandross. Yeah. yeah. Great I like singer. That. I like that, yeah. Stop to love. Mm-hmm. But so much of his stuff at this time, it's explicitly written for and marketed to a kind of corporate lawyer black bourgeoisie yeah, and yeah, that's explicitly right. what this song is you're all about right. stop right. to love you're working too hard you're doing too much overtime with as your corporate lawyers you know uh, and you know I, I like him as a singer but i just don't give a fuck about these people that he's singing about you know i interviewed luther i was lucky enough to interview luther i'm not going to tell you the, the backstory to all of this another time uh, and i i wouldn't in any way say anything negative he's such a nice guy luther he's such a nice guy but by the time I met him, Los Angeles had taken over the R&B soul of black music in America. So remember, at this time, 1987 or a few years before that, Motown move out of Detroit. Where they go to, they go to California. Mm-hmm. And Is this also the moment? when Michael Jackson loses contact with reality. I think you're absolutely right. And I've, let me just look at my notes here because I'll tell you exactly what I said that echoes what you just said. So Michael Jackson is in the charts with bad, okay? And I say, Michael trying to act like a bad boy. It's ludicrous. Hard to believe. Hard to believe. Hard everything, to believe. Everything that he'd done before. Yeah, yeah. You, you could... You could he was singing about things and you believed that he mm. lived it. Yeah. Everything. Even when he yeah. was a kid singing about love, you know, you oh, believed yeah. that he'd had oh, yeah. those feelings. Oh. You believed that, that he'd lived it. I he, actually love the, 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 the first single off this out, this album, the um, duet with Cedar Garrett. I just, I know, I knew you. what, I'll, t- I'll tell you about that. I'll tell you about that. I but, knew Cedar Garrett, you know? Right. Cause she, she sung with, uh, with um, fucking oh, brand new heavies. Brand new heavies. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Um, but, but bad is when that came out, and he just saw the video and he think, this is preposterous. This is, this is Michael Jackson retreating into a fantasy world. Yeah, 100% right. What I next say is that how difficult it is to follow the biggest selling album of all time. Thriller was the biggest selling album of all time. Most of us who knew and loved Michael Jackson would say Off the Wall is his best ever album. But okay, I'll give you Thriller. There are some tracks in Thriller that connected with me, clicked with me. Not the, you know, we're going off to see a horror movie thriller, but, you know, one or two of the, um, the way you make me feel, all of those tunes were sweet. That's Michael Jackson. Here now, he's trying to find a way to navigate his career. Michael Jackson, as far as I knew him, and I got close enough to um, see him up close and personal in Paris, although he was trying to avoid me, obviously. Um, but my missus actually recorded with Michael Jackson. Did I ever tell you this? No. Okay, she's um, booked to do a session in a studio, you know, with other singers, other backing singers and everything. And they're all sitting there wondering who's booked this session in Walks Michael Jackson. And he's doing a kind of a, a kind of a USA feed the world kind of, you know, USA for Africa kind of thing. But in England, he's doing it and getting a lot of singers to go. You know, my missus worked a whole day or a couple of days with Michael Jackson. And he's an athlete, first of all. You know, he, don't think of him as a singer. Think about his dancing. He's a flipping athlete. He was the most toned you know it's like looking at Cristiano Ronaldo in football but you know a slimmer version and not necessarily the muscles in all those places but he was also somebody who had lived his life through the prism of music and it's almost kind of like when he made Thriller it was the point where most musicians will say right I've done it that's the ultimate album you know it's you know it's the Beatles Sgt Peppers let's just move on split up and you know give up the music industry at least part of it that we were in where's Michael Jackson supposed to go after Thriller so the muse has left him the muse has left him 
I, that song, I just can't help loving you. It was written by Sidney Garrett. It wasn't mm. written by Michael Jackson. Mm. So the muse has left him. And yet he's at the top of his game. He's still a young guy. He's probably at this point, 28 years old. And he's got nowhere to go, but to and try. It, it, it also, it's a painful process. There's one, I, I hadn't clicked with this until he, until he died. I always thought it was a song of great celebration. I want to be starting something. It was yeah, only yeah. when he died that I paid attention to the lyrics. And this is in his great period. Yeah. And it, it's, a, it's a song of immense pain. Yeah, yeah. Now, with all the African thing, you know, I, and, and he used it to start the gigs as well. well I just assumed it, it was like celebration. You know, let's get yeah, going. Yeah, let's get yeah, out there. That's and how it, the audience it, takes it. it. It's not. It, it's, yeah. a, it, it's a confession of, of huge pain. Mm. I actually think one of the great things about Billie Jean is it straddles his sanity and his madness. Because Billie Jean is a song of, an ex, it's an expression of paranoia, isn't it? Yeah, it's, an, yeah. it's, it's an expression of someone yeah. who now is unable to trust anyone around him. Nothing and no one around him really makes sense to him anymore. Yeah. But he can still rationalise it. He rationalises it through the music. And that makes it such a great, such a great song. After that, he's, he, he goes off, he drifts off into this fantasy world. You know, trying to come off as as, as bad, which is just preposterous, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And I, I didn't think about that about Billy Jean, but I think you have an absolute valid point there, actually. As that point, okay. So bad with Michael Jackson's number three, Cliff Richard, some people's number four. Yeah, sweet little song, but it's Cliff Richard. It's what you expect from Cliff Richard. Madonna at number five, though. Have a listen to that and see if causing a commotion doesn't sound like bad. Bad is at number three, causing a yeah. commotion. It's got virtually the same bass line. It's uh -huh. got the same beat. It's got almost the same melody, maybe a little bit of a faster beat, but it's got virtually the same melody. So at this point, even though we're sort of like saying, oh, Michael Jackson's all shit at this point, the rest of the music industry doesn't think so. They're still following him. Madonna is following Michael Jackson at this point. After that, uh, two themes from movies, uh, or at least one is Miami Vice and the other Full Metal Jacket, six and seven in the charts. At number eight, This House Nation is just shit. Uh, LL Cool J, I wanted to talk about, this is the point, this is the point where LL Cool J um, actually just destroys all his rap credentials. I can tell you, this was his biggest hit, I Need Love. This point is number nine in the English charts. He might even have gone to number one, but it's basically somebody who's a rapper just talking. And he's not talking like Eric B and Rakim, because Eric B and Rakim would say, you know, I used to be a stick up kid, but now I'm righteous. Whereas uh, LL Cool J is talking and saying, oh, it's been so hard touring. I just need somebody, I need love. Come on, man. This is the reason why you're not a rapper anymore. How, how on earth, why on earth did you throw away? He was one of the biggest rappers. When I saw LL Cool J, first time I saw LL Cool J, do you know who the support bands were to him? On, Hammersmith yeah. Odeon. LL Cool J by himself comes out of the huge oversized beatbox, you know, just like his, his gym trousers on and, you know, and, and nothing on top because he's got a six pack and he did the swagger and he's wearing the Kangol hat, just like you know him to be. The support band are the next level is uh, Eric B and Rakim. And who do you think the ones are that start the show? Two levels be behind LL Cool J. Come on, man, you know it. I don't, unless you're going to say Public Enemy or something. That's exactly no. what I'm going to you're say. You're joking. I'm not joking. You're joking. <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? Yeah. That LL Cool J at that time was a bigger rapper than Public Enemy. Leagues behind them. Uh, the, he, they were leagues behind him. The gig was at Hammersmith. Oh, uh, the gig was at the Hammersmith Odeon, as I remember it, by the way. But um, there he just completely throws it away. And this is the beginning of the sign that the industry is going to control this rap thing. Yeah, somebody yeah. told him to do that shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody told him to do it. And he said, oh, your name, LL, that stands for ladies love. Well, let's do one that the ladies will love then. Yeah, Cool J. And it killed him. Uh, and and it, you can see further, number 12, 
it's the fat boys and the beach boys. <laughs> Are you having a fucking laugh? <laughs> Come on, Tim. I wanted to. I wanted. To, I still want to throw something at my flipping screen when this nonsense comes on. Come, the Fat Boys were one of the original rap groups. One of the originals. You know, you had the Human Beatbox. The Human Beatbox. He's the one that did the. <laughs> he's dead now. He's late, by the way. He's um, he died. Not least because he was so overweight. Um, I trust. But a nice guy though. But you know he's a human beatbox, and now they're doing some kind of like wipeout with the, with the Beach Boys, and I couldn't figure out who is most embarrassed by this because the Beach Boys can't show their face again after this, and the Fat Boys. Well, you've just told us you're leaving the rap community and trying to become pop stars. Good luck to you, but don't ever come in. Don't ever darken my. A musical but uh, like is, isn't isn't this isn't this illuminative because what we're moaning about both with the football and with the music is the industry bringing its own logic killing the original logic of the football killing the original logic of of, of the music uh, and, and trying to squeeze as much out of it as as you can and, and so all i could say for those who wanted wanted to do it be it from the music industry or be it from the football industry is uh, as uh, as shock g would have said would have said about them just grab them in the biscuits i knew shock well i met shock g a couple of times i said i knew him but i did spend some time with him uh on melrose avenue in los angeles just kept bumping into him two or three times we had some great you know repartee together he was a nice guy he was a he was a cool dude, you know, and I remember him very vividly. I remember he came out of a, I bumped into him, he'd come out of a laundrette and he had his sort of like jacket that he was going to wear on stage that evening and everything like that. And we just sat and talked about rap life. Uh, I don't think Tupac was blown up at that point. So Tupac was with Digital Underground for a minute, so I knew Tupac, but uh, I don't think uh, Tupac featured in our conversation at all. Did he Did he try to grab you in the biscuits at any, any, any nah. time in your conversation? Funny enough, as you know, his alter ego or his alter egos, because he had more than one, uh, might have done that. But I was on safe ground, so to speak, on terra firme. But, you know, he should have been in this chart at this time. Big shout out for the Bee Gees, one of their great songs, You Win Again, one of the great, great um, love songs or, you know, love songs gone wrong, if you like. Um, no big shout for Sunita, even though I'm, uh, I knew her mother, Miguel Brown, very well. Miguel Brown came over as part of the original hair cast from America. So her mother's American. Mm. But Toy Boy is a pastiche of what uh, Kylie Minogue made her own. Uh, just about this time as well, through Slot Aiken and Waterman, the unfortunate... Who are, who are there with Rick Astley? They're there with Rick Astley. Uh, we, we ne never going to give you one. up. Yeah, Number two. Because yeah. <laughs> they were everywhere at the time, yeah, weren't it, yeah, Slot yeah, and, and I don't know if, if you remember, but it might have been around this time. They released something really good. Princess. No. So, uh, Road, Road, oh, I didn't. I didn't know they were behind Princess. Yeah, Roadblock. Yeah, yeah, and they kind of put it put it out on the sly to try and fool people. Yeah, and yeah. It, it's great. And it's when I when when I listen to Roadblock, I, I think, why do you want to spend all your time doing this schlock if you can because, do this? Because the pot pays more. That's yeah, always obviously. the reason. Yeah, That's the reason yeah. why they're doing. It. I knew China very well, by the way. China very very well. She calls herself the Ballhead. Dread or something like that. Now she's gone to live in Jamaica, but at the time she first time I went to interview her it was somewhere in West Hampstead, and she was uh, together with this guy who was a bit of a, you know, uh, well, uh, he was um, he was portraying himself as a diamond merchant at the time, uh, Anthony G. But you know, uh, good luck to him. Um, but she had just had a small child with him and everything. And so I'll tell you the problem with Stock Aitken and Waterman, Princess Say I'm Your Number One was the very first song that they put out, got into the charts. But I would say they didn't treat their black artists, from what the black artists have said to me, 
with the respect that they should have been treated, whether it's financially or otherwise. So they they couldn't keep their black artists. They should have done more with China, but China was going off. No, no, I'm going to go solo now. Princess the same, and and, and nothing became of their solo careers. I'm not knocking. It's not Kate and Waterman. They did the thing they wanted to do in the way they wanted to do it. But actually, if Stock Aiken and Waterman had put into China what they put into Kylie Minogue, mm -hmm. China would be one of the biggest stars in Britain today. You know, if they put their effort into it, she would be one of the biggest uh, stars right. today, which she isn't, you know. So there'll be a sadness there. All in all, though, this chart, is it a chart that we can go like this with? Or not? Yeah, I, yeah. There's not a lot for me in there. I just want a quick shout out for for Stevie Winwood, who's in there with Valerie, uh, who one of the great English R and B talents. I, I often think he could have been more. When I listened to "I'm a Man" from, that he did with Spencer Davis when he was like 17 or something like that, it it it, it it's Ray Charles. It's Ray Charles really kicking it, uh, and uh, I think maybe he blended out a little bit. Um, but Valor is a nice, a, a nice song. Oh yeah, and although Perhaps Steve, he's too well, nice for his own good, maybe Stevie Winwood. Well, this is the thing. You, you know, my missus knows him. I'm I sorry to keep name that, dropping. But... She recorded an entire album in his studio. He's got a studio out in the Oxfordshire countryside somewhere, and he's very selective about the people he allows to record there. And it's like a, it's the equivalent of. Um, if you like, um, you know, the BBC's uh, Made of Ale Studios that um, Beats was recorded in, what's it called again? Abbey Road. It's equivalent of that because it's got a huge kind of space for an entire live band. <clears throat> she had a jazz album, she's work, uh, she's recorded that will come out soon. But she did it entirely in Steve Winwood's uh, studio and he comes around and, you know, has a listen and has a conversation and everything like that as well. And I think the thing with Steve Winwood is that he was just a child prodigy uh, that was on Island Records initially. You know, Chris Blackwell, yeah. that Keep On Running was just one of the greatest songs of British. Oh, I'm a man's much better. I'm a man's just you extraordinary. You reckon? It's so full on. It's yeah, like, yeah. It's really driven. But Keep On Running is the biggie, though, isn't it? Yeah, well, I, I prefer I'm a man, but... Yeah, no, it's fair enough, yeah. You, you're allowed to prefer what you man. like to prefer. I'm just telling you what the rest of us prefer. <laughs> you're allowed to be wrong. The, record. <laughs> yeah, the rest of us are allowed to be wrong. Yeah, yeah. The, rest of you, the rest of humanity has been I'm wrong not, on a I'm number of sure. occasions. <laughs> I'm not sure, and I'm sure that you're delighted to see you two are in there with the streets that have no names. Yeah, so no, how not much really you love. <laughs> I know, it's, uh, that's why I'm rubbing Made it. Made my ears bleed in 1981. <laughs> They'll make your ears bleed again. They ain't done yet, mate. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. What? Uh, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Oh, Get Down by Derek B. Original UK rapper. Yeah, original UK rapper. Can I tell you an anecdote? Please. do with me and some girls, yeah? But it is to do with my very first girlfriend. <laughs> Nothing to do with me. And I heard this through somebody else as well. Uh, another woman who said, my very first girlfriend and her were in New York for what used to be called the New Music Seminar. That was a big sort of music uh, festival that, you know, for the industry they used to hold in New York. And Derek B was there. And uh, they both decided, yeah, let's see which one of us he wants to shag. And uh, and then he was like, all kind of like shy and everything. They said, come on now, yeah, it's all big now. You can have both of us if you want. <laughs> My ex-girlfriend said to Terry B, it didn't happen, is all I can tell you. <laughs> and Rock he's and late roll. now. He's late yeah. now. So, yeah. you know, rest in peace, Derek B. Original rapper. When I saw him, he was driving a second hand, but nevertheless a Porsche. And with his baseball cap backwards, like, you know, was the Dewey girl mm -hmm. for him. Does that make you, does that hurt you? No, no, no. Okay. I, I feel enriched by by, uh, well, by, by, by my new cultural knowledge. Yeah, by the anecdotes, because I know you didn't like the baseball cap, so I just thought mm -hmm. I'd throw that one in as well. Tim, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Done.